talk today about being negative. And it's gonna be two components to that. The first component is going to be the negative structure, like what is being negative? Why or what are the things that you should be thinking about um, in the context of occupying that role? And then I'm going to connect that to the packet, the JV Varsity packet, which is the Abolish ICE Affirmative. This by no means will serve to explain the um, particular arguments fully. Um, there will be separate practice lectures that I will give throughout the year to help build the conversation um, because ultimately my goal is to get the varsity students cutting their own cards and building the packet further so that there are more arguments uh, and that there are deeper arguments because this should only be a starter. Our varsity folks should be the ones that are pushing things along um, and the goal would also be that as we move up the season, our JV folks become varsity to do these things as well. So that is what this lecture is going to be about. Less of the card cutting, just this is what Jasmine's goal is. Um, what I put together these lectures to move us forward. So yeah, being negative, let's talk about it. Um, student objectives. Uh, students will understand the burden of rejoinder. Students will understand um, presumption and the status quo, and students will review the bottle negative evidence. Uh, students will not have to worry about all the technical options of deploying the arguments. That was all the stuff that I had said above that I'm not going to give you the complete backdrop of the counter plan, the internal net benefit, and the uh, critique all today because that would be way too much, and we don't have time for that. So, burden of rejoinder. I forgot to create a slide for presumption, so we'll talk about it. Um, after I talk about the burden of rejoinder. If you have further questions about that, this is supposed to be a conversation. So when you have questions, please let me know. That is what I'm here for. So burden of rejoinder. This is the central role of the negative. You have to respond to the affirmative. Rejoinder, right? It is called a response. The, affirm the negative has a job to respond to the AF and to refute it. Um, and so the negative that fails to effectively respond slash test the affirmative has not met the burden of being negative, right? There is a burden of being negative and that is not only is it, I said something to the affirmative, but I said something to the affirmative that effectively tests the ability for the affirmative to solve or to be AF, um, and that could come at different levels. And we'll talk about that um, as we move forward because this is different than the burden of proof, right? Where the AF has to defend the entirety of the 1AC, right? So all eight minutes of what happened, um, the affirmative, the affirmative just can't be like, you know what, JK, we don't wanna go with the AF anymore. No, you, you can't do that because it's the plan. It's the thing that's being debated over. Um, but the difference, the negative, is that you only have to find one thing about the affirmative that is bad, doesn't solve, doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera, and blow that up. And that one thing can be the reason for why the affirmative doesn't win, right? So it's picking and choosing. If this is the, um, if we were to think of this in, in the context of tactical mindset, this is where you're just putting together a puzzle finding that one piece and taking it out, puzzle's not complete anymore. That is the role of the negative. Now, actually before I move to that slide, because it's gonna start saying some things that aren't what I wanna discuss right now, which is presumption. Presumption is um, the status quo. The negative, al ah, the negative always gets the status quo as an option and what that means, right, is that when the affirmative presents itself in the debate, this is something that has not happened yet, right? This is something that has yet to occur, but the affirmative thinks that it should because it can resolve, solve for a very guaranteed worst case scenario and or impact if it is not resolved. Are y'all following me? Does that make sense of like why, like just what the affirmative is why it's important at the level of it not happening in the status quo. Because if it's happening right now, why do we, like, 
okay, then what are we debating about? Like, if it's happening now, that's called the status quo. So the negative always gets the status quo um, as an option, and that either means that, one, the affirmative is no different than what is happening now. So your argument would be that even if the affirmative in and of itself has not happened, what it claims to solve or how it solves is very much so the same as what is happening now. And therefore the affirmative has not met the burden of significance, uh, well, which is part of the burden of proof, which was in the pri prior lecture that was given last week. But if you missed that, no worries. The workshop, we're going to really put these two concepts and ideas in conversation with one another. So I highly, highly recommend coming to that. Um, but uh, that's an, an example of presumption. Another example of presumption, right, would be that the affirmative or in the context of the negative, when we say the negative gets the status quo, um, is that the affirmative, not only is it not any different, right, but what it does solve for doesn't need to be solved for, right? Like either one, that impact has already been solved. Um, that impact is not, like it's already happened. F solving it doesn't make a lot of sense because the impact is already here or uh, the AF's ability to resolve that it's not as high. It gets an interesting um, minutia, interesting minutia, but at the very base of it, that is the idea of the negative always gets it as an option, right? The negative doesn't have to present an alternative, right? Present um, a rather we should do this or rather we should do this. The negative could just simply be there's no reason for the app, or the app doesn't do anything. And that should be a sufficient way for you to vote negative because you have tested the affirmative to see that it's no different, right? And the affirmative has to win that they are different, that it's not just given to the app. And the negative can prove that um, via a lot of presumption arguments. Uh, but once again, those are for different, that's a different lecture to get into the specifics of examples of that, especially in the context of this packet, but we will get into some as we get to the bottom of the lecture. Reviewing the stock issues from the negative perspective, like I said, there was a lecture that was earlier this week, uh, or not earlier this week, last week, that covered what the stock issues are in the context of the affirmative. Now, this is the stock issues in the context of the negative. What is, how are you dismantling the AF? So solvency, if you're not familiar, the stock issues, solvency, harms, uh, inherency, topicality, and significance. Those are the stock issues. Some folks refer to it in a certain acronym that I'm not going to say on camera, but if you put two and two together, you can probably put, put what the acronym is that I'm not saying. Uh, solvency. The negative can win that the affirmative doesn't solve for its impact. Uh, for example, there's a solvency deficit, right? There's a circumvention argument. Um, and an example of that would be a kind of political crackdown arg, right? A lot of times in debate, the argument is that conservatives will react to the plan um, in a way that causes for it to not uh, not pass because the affirmative would cause for this type of reform or this kind of legal scrutiny that uh, conservatives are not in favor of. And so they will respond to the plan by saying no. These are examples of like circumvention arts in the packet. You will see it as like Trump circumvents the plan um, or that uh, abolition not sufficient, not enough, not clear enough. Uh, for how it solves and so therefore it doesn't solve. These are arguments versus the affirmative that tackle solvency. Next is topicality. Uh, the negative, and there's not a T argument um, in the current iteration of the bottle packet, but it's important to discuss and talk about. At some point we may or we may not add T into the um, chat, as I will say, but it's something that I am thinking about. So the negative can win that the app isn't topical. This means that the affirmative forces the negative to have a debate outside 
of how the resolution is defined, which is unfair to the negative. So we have a resolution that we debate all year long. The resolution does not change. The resolution says that the United States federal government should enact a substantial reform in CJR, criminal justice, right, in one or more of the following areas, sentencing, policing, and forensic science, and or forensic science. Um, and so the affirmative can have debates uh, as to whether or not um, the affirmative or the negative can have a debate as to whether or not the affirmative meets substantial or the affirmative meets an act or the affirmative meets reform. Um, like is abolition a reform or is abolished different than reform? What does that mean in the particular context of what the negative came prepared to debate? A preparedness that they have to win is tethered to the resolution. Um, yeah. So the next is harms. Um, so the negative can win that the affirmative harms are either not that big, probable, or have a long time frame, uh, which is called impact defense, or um, the act causes for the harm to get worse, or that there are worse harms that the plan causes, or the app's impact is good. Um, so the last part, right, so like the or the impact is good is called an impact turn. Um, but the other examples of what I said when I was like, the app causes the harms to get worse or that there are worse harms that the plan causes, that is just turning the app. Um, that's sometimes what dis ads do, right? And we'll see that with the internal net benefit in the packet. Um, that the affirmative gets rid of HSI by abolishing ICE and abolishing HSI is actually really bad because they are key components in targeting um, what they would argue are legitimate criminal uh, charges across the border for sexual trafficking and sexual violence, getting rid of ICE gets rid of that, which uh, would be a harmed argument, right, for the app causes for worse things to occur. You feel me? You with me? Make sense? Yeah? No? Maybe so. Ah, perfect. All right, so uh, the NEG stock issues continued. We have two more. One is inherency. The F has to win that the plan isn't happening in the status quo. We did some of that when we were talking about presumption. That's what presumption is speaking to. It's speaking to inherency. Um, and if not, if the affirmative does not win, the plan is not happening in the status quo, or um, the plan is no different than the status quo, the negative can win on a presumption argument that the AF is in the world right now, or the AF doesn't cause a big enough difference to the world that resolves the impact, right? So the negative, you will hear, vote negative on presumption. The AF has not proven why they're any different uh, than the status quo, or even why you know, the affirmative would solve for the impact that they claim to solve for, they have to prove what difference, right, would exist in how the app attempts to solve. Lastly is significance. The negative can win that the app's impacts aren't that important or big, or that the app isn't big enough to resolve its impacts. Now, I wanna be clear, because I know sometimes people can conflate some of the stuff on presumption with um, significance. And so I wanna take a pause here. The difference in significance and inherency is that inherency has nothing to do with the impact, right? Inherency is just simply, there are obstacles in getting the plan to exist right now, right? Like it's not a bill that is passed in Congress today. Um, but rather is a proposal. It is a proposal that the plan thinks should happen because if it were to pass, it would resolve these things. That's why we hear the word, and this might be a new word for a lot of folks, fiat. Fiat changes the debate from a question of if, but rather to should, right? Not if the plan passes, but when the plan passes, should this be the course of action, right, that uh, must be taken to resolve the AF's impact? Because if we only had debates around if the plan gets passed, 
you know, the, those debates miss away from um, a lot of really robust debates as it centers around the counter plan, around dissets, because all the debate would be is, nope, that wouldn't pass. All right, next, but not like, okay, let's live in a world where it does pass. What are the benefits? What are the legal structures, right, for how that kind of passing would take place and what it would resolve at the level of the uh, evidence packet? So like, does abolition create meaningful, comprehensive immigration reform? Right. If we were at the if level, we wouldn't get to that question because it would just be debate centered around nope, AF wouldn't pass. So like, let's not even discuss kind of a world in which abolition is on the docket. So like, that's inherency. Uh, significance. Significance has a lot to do with impact. Um, so like, one, the AF has to win. And this is where impact calculus right becomes a thing. That the impact that they claim to solve is important. Right. Um, like. Is it an impact that is big enough, right, or meaningful enough, more essential enough um, to vote affirmative, right? Like if we were like, and this is just me being funny and silly, like frogs, right? Like frog decline. Now frog decline would be probably bad, right? But like in the grander scheme of like, if the negative were to present um, global nuclear war, for example, right? And the F is like, but frog decline. It's not gonna, like, the, the, the ability at the level of significance for the affirmative might not be too great because the impact in and of itself might not meet the threshold of magnitude. That is a debate that can be had, but how the negative is engaging in it is that there's not enough significance to your impact in comparison to an alternate impact that the plan causes to happen. And so the affirmative has to win that not only one, impact big, important, great, essential, but also two, that the AF is enough to solve it, right? That the AF is a big enough component to resolve that impact because sometimes, and this is like not T or it is T, uh, affirmatives can claim to solve a lot more than what they can, right? Um, and it comes down to a question of how does this one action lead to a meaningful internal link chain that resolves this impact? Work me through that. Oh, okay, that only, sure. Significance test. Um, so that's what these things come down to. Oop, gotta click. So now that we've done that, I think it's important to like talk about evidence. So we have three, Two, I say three, two, because the internal net benefit is part of the counter plan, but it is a internal net benefit. So there's like a disset. I will explain what I mean in a second. So everyone's like, what, Jack? What does that mean? I got you. It's all right. Um, but there's off case positions and there's the case neg. So you're looking at your packet and you see the off case and you see the counter plan, the critique, and the HSI stuff. You see that. And then you see case neg. Right now, I'm talking about the stuff that's not the case net. Um, so we have the reform counter plan, the internal HSI net benefit, and we have the settler colonialism uh, critique. So the reform counter plan, let's talk about it. The text says, the United States federal government should end arbitrary immigration enforcement by one, reforming immigration laws to change all immigration crimes into civil offenses, and B, directing the HSI to focus immigration enforcement solely on criminals and national security threats. Um, let's talk about this a little bit, right, before moving on to some quotes from the evidence, is why the counter plan? So there's a reason quite literally, why it's called a reform counter plan versus an abolition affirmative. And that is that there are some things about ICE and ICE is not necessarily, there are different subsections within ICE that if we were to abolish the entirety of the program, there are programs within that that would also be terminated. The counter plan says that we should not terminate those particular programs because they are key and effective for um, focusing on, and it says, criminals and national security threats. But Jasmine, the words criminal and national security threats is probably racialized. It probably is, uh, to be honest, even in the most 
liberal best mindset possible. Um, but there's a part of the counter plan that tries to make this better, right, in terms of um, zeroing in what they mean by crime and what they mean by national security threats. And that is the first plank of the plan text saying that we would reform immigration laws to change all immigration crimes into civil offenses. Right now, if you are an undocumented uh, immigrant, everything that you do is characterized as a criminal offense. Um, and even if you have a visa with the United States, if like a, like a temporary one, um, that the you have like a one strike rule. Um, and those things are deemed as criminal more so than if you were a citizen or if you had a permanent or LPR, so legal permanent resident residency, uh, because you are here on good faith of the United States. So the civil, uh, when it says changing all immigration crimes into civil offenses, it changes that if a um, undocumented immigrant were to do something that breaks a law in the United States, it's not seen as being a crime at the level of going to like prison um, or a being hung your record, but rather a civil offense that doesn't mean that you automatically have to be deported or that you have to leave the United States or that you have a strike on your record as it pertains to losing visa standing and status. Um, and so this is the kind of reform, the argument would be that this would mean the functionality of ICE wouldn't exist as much because there would not be legal standing for them to, how do I word this? There would not be legal standing for them to, um, to not deport because ICE is not that, but wouldn't be standing for them to go into areas and to take fix because there would be no crime that was committed because of the redesignation of that. There definitely are debates as to whether or not that is effective or if that really means anything in the context of ICE. Um, but those are debates that y'all can have. Um, the second part to this, right, is that there are components of HSI that focus on then the real criminals. And so we're going to get into a card here um, that's an advocate for the CP taxes, the first card in the 1NC uh, to the counter plan that kind of distinguishes the importance of HSI. Um, and we'll get into it now. It says that many are trying or attempting to portray the Abolish ICE movement. Um, as a shadow campaign for open borders, but as those statements above show, it is largely political grandstanding without much substance. There is not much point in abolishing ICE if another government agency then gains the same power. Untangling ICE from the rest of DHS can be tricky without wholesale reform. The goal is to limit interior immigration enforcement to serious criminals and remove the constant fear felt by law-abiding immigrants. There are two legal reforms that will functionally abolish ICE without disbanding the agency. Reform immigration law to change all crimes into civil offenses. The second is to reorganize HSI, which is Homeland Security Investigations, into um, by giving it the responsibility of um, ERO, and that's the Enforcement Removal Operations, um, and then abolishing the latter agency, which would be the ICE officers deportation services at the level of like going into the states, not at the border. Um, and that both reforms will be substantially weakened, uh, immigration enforcement for non-criminals and abolish the worst parts of ICE without removing its ability to deport serious criminals and national security threats. Of course, this is still up to debate as to like who is in charge of kind of deciding who are these serious criminals. Is it only a question of what's happening at the border with like um, sexual trafficking um, and just large movement of uh, paraphernalia across the border. But things like that would then become the debate as to would it just be that or does that still open the door enough to justify arbitrary capturing of folks, um, et cetera, et cetera. So reform versus abolish. What are the pros and cons of abolish versus reform? These are questions that the debate is centered on when we're affirmative and we're negative with this packet. What are the pros and cons of abolish versus reform? 
Is abolish ICE the necessary starting point to comprehensive immigration reform? I want to add a second, I want a kind of subpart to that. Is comprehensive immigration reform something that should be tethered or combined with ICE or with abolishing ICE? Next, is HSI effective? And these are all questions that are central for this counter plan debate. Because the counter plan, in many ways, has to win that HSI is as great <laughs> as it says, because that's the issue that the counter plan takes up is that if we abolish ICE, it gets rid of HSI. We only care about HSI if HSI is great, right? That is how the counter plan competes. And once again, we will have later lectures that break down the, like the logistics of being affirmative and negative with counter plans. We will do all that work. This is not this lecture. This is just to kind of inform you about what is here in the negative packet. What is the argument? The internal net benefit. This is the link that the plan would result in the termination of the HSI division. The negative has to read some evidence that says that getting rid of ICE would get rid of HSI. The first card that I read does gesture towards this, right? But a secondary card that is shorter in the packet, the second card, um, helps get there. It says that ICE's Homeland Security Investigation Division, HSI, which is a division of ICE, um, and the ERO, the guys who bust down doors, are harming the entire agency's reputation and undermining other law enforcement agencies' willingness to cooperate. So basically making an intermingling argument that they're so commingled that if we got rid of ICE or get rid of HSI, but also the um, other part is that HSI is not that bad and also would be compliant with not being the bad law enforcement that ICE officers and the bad parts of ICE are part of. That's what this argument is claiming. Um, the warrant for why HSI is key to criminal investigations, in particular to sex trafficking, uh, et cetera, et cetera, is that in 2005, uh, this is evidence in your packet. Everything that I'm quoting is evidence in your packet. So if you're like, Jasmine, why do I care about these these blocks of information in particular, it's because this is the evidence that you have in your hand um, or on your computer screen and also on your Zoom screen. Um, so in 2005, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement and Homeland Security Investigations created the Border Enforcement Security Task Force. Um, this is BEST. Um, and that the local team, so BEST, is crucial to security, um, and this is in the particular context of what is happening across the border, like a very specific area and region, not like as much in the United States. Because the idea is that BEST is best able to have good surveillance and strategy so that it's not kind of get into, you know, the interior of um, the states and whatnot. So uh, with that, I read that part. So the local team is crucial to security given the area's international ties, drug smuggling, weapons, trafficking, intellectual property rights, money laundering, and a variety of other disciplines. These would be arguments that would be federal crimes and not civil offenses, right? Like these are like criminal crimes that would not be seen as civil. And civil is more like a, you know, pack a admonishing like, no, don't do that. Here's a fine versus like, no, you have to go to jail. Um, or the context of what I said about to immig uh, immigration status, losing that status and being deported. Um, so yeah, there's that. The settler colonialism critique. Now, I know y'all are like, all right, Jasmine, this is where you really lose us. Like, what? I didn't even put cards in this because once again, I think I'm gonna do a part one, part two for the critique. One, what it is, what it is, <laughs> and then two, what do we do with this? Um, so this will not be just like a, the first time and only time you hear about this critique because dense and it is also going to build and grow because I am also someone who likes to update the packet and keep y'all informed about what is happening because I want to see these debates build and grow and I care about y'all learning and growing and debate. So what is the historical foundation for the critique? 
The critique makes the argument that the world is situated on a settler colonial foundation that produces power through ownership of land, bodies, and labor. Let me say that one more time. Produces power through ownership of land, bodies, and labor. There's a very historical foundation for this, uh, this argument that is specific to the United States uh, formation, so like the inception of the United States, you know, Boston Tea Party, even before that coming 1492, um, and even before that, <laughs> um, kind of the way in which the New Americas are seen. Um, that, and before, yeah, uh, yeah, well, once again, for those who really wanna get deep, that's SLC. For those who want just the foundation of these debates, you're at the right place. So um, it's important for terms like native and Indian, and I will be specific to this moment, that if you are not black, <laughs> if you are non-black slash non-indigenous slash not brown, and brown not in the context of like um, Southeast Asian slash no relationship to the socio-historical formation of genocide and captivity, or genocide and slavery. This is not a term that necessarily you should use when referring to natives. I say this because there might be some small un underlying parts of the evidence uh, that say this, but I'm not a big fan of telling folks about how, uh, telling black folks and brown folks about how to write through literature. Um, this is just for y'all to be cognizant, right, and thinking more about the words that we use. This is not like you using demeaning um, language, but it's important to be cognizant of the literal language that you use because it comes with power, especially if you are not black, not brown, or not indigenous, not indigenous brown. So yeah. Um, some other things that I want to talk about with this, because I don't spend too much, I actually no, I do, uh, is the link argument. Before I do that though, just a bit more historical foundation of this is that settler colonialism comes not only from the idea of colonization, so right, when the land is taken over and the, the people on the land are taken over and a new civilization emerges, but rather it's this idea of production, the way in which bodies, right, can be used to create um, systems of morals and ethics, right? So there are bodies after genocide and slavery have taken place. And I say after, not as though they have ended, they have just changed their linguistic um, capacity in 2020. But that at the moment of colonization, right, and these new, um, new metrics of morals and ethics have been produced, there have been bodies that matter, right, and bodies that don't matter. Um, and this is not necessarily like the similar, it's similar to has historical tracings to the moment we see now, right, with Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, and all that business, but literally it, cre it created a kind of soci a sociological basis for how are we able to identify bodies that do matter and bodies that do not matter. Bodies that are able to have access to capital, have access to civil society at the level of participating amongst uh, settlers, um, who were those people and who were not those people? Who were those people? Were white folks who settled the land, uh, who were adjacent to those people, who were, who were imbued some of those authorities. Um, this is where you can come to SLC to get a bit more historical foundation, but there, this idea of sovereignty is difficult because some folks are imbued sovereignty and some are not, for example, historically, that we do have natives that in their fight against settlers would move towards, you know, ownership of slaves to kind of show that they are a resistant threat to white folks, right? That that is a sovereignty um, that black folks do not have um, because they were the commodity that was used as the exchange. Now, you're like, whoa, all these things, Jasmine, these words, I know, it's a lot. I'm trying to break this down in a way that is still like beginner friendly. So if I'm not doing the best job of that, my apologies. Um, Mr. Um, 
Trump, did you have something to say? I didn't know if you turned the camera on if you wanted to interject, say something. Oh, okay, sorry. I just want to make sure that I'm not, you know, taking up too much space. Um, but yeah, that's some historical foundation that when we're saying settler colonialism, it's not just the colonization or taking over of lands, but it's what was produced from that and what continues to exist relationally. We're talking about sociological formations and why and how power is reproduced. And a lot of the times that's not based in land, i.e. I have this land, that's it. No, it's about who has the capacity to have a relationship to land and who is written out of that. The argument would be that black folks and indigenous folks, native folks, and I use native as a particular racial formation for the United States, are locked out of that. That is the world that we live in. That is the theory that the critique resides in. You're like, okay, so like, hmm, what do we do with that? What is the link argument that the affirm that the negative is making to the affirmative? Great question. I have an answer. So the affirmative is un is. What the negative would say is that the affirmative is another act of redress that operates through ceding land, authority, and ownership of power to the sovereign. The sovereign being the United States federal government, the sovereign being the accepted kind of mores or um, ethics and morals of civil society of the world for how we should properly abolish or how we should properly um, engage the law. Oh, of course, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, and that the affirmative plays into that appeasing structure. Uh, this is bad because it leads to the perfection of settlement and produces ongoing impacts of genocidal logic, i.e. when we're compliant with the sovereign, the sovereign has no role or goal of abolition. It isn't the role of abolishing itself from authority, ownership, and control. And so long as the U.S., right, in its kind of inception and performance of owning who has value and who does not, there is never a policy that can be made that does not rely on these very settler colonial foundations rather reproduces worse things or just the same bad things continually, i.e. an example of does abolish ICE, is it clear enough? Does it actually lead to changes in the context of native rights, in the context of black rights, in the context of any of those things? Are rights even something that is big enough, right? All of these questions emerge when we're questioning is abolish ICE, when we kind of move away from the power and like react, like the radicality of it, is it enough? And so then the, app, the other link argument is that the app is a reform not abolition, right? That the AF is just another immigration reform. And that that is this, it operates in the same logic that the affirmative is trying to break out of because it doesn't actually change the foundation. It plays the same game. Those are the links. The alt, I wanted to make it very simple, very conceptually simple, and that is to burn it down. No compliance. Here is a quote from the evidence in your packet. Um, we believe that it's by no means extreme to posit that one solution to these ills is to destroy, to burn down contemporary institutions of governance, policing, and comfort to cooperatively dismantle the workings of the state. For us, a radical project of abolition and insurgent pol political praxis refuses to negotiate with the state or to seek recognition from any of its bureaucratic uh, apparatuses. Um, political projects of compromise with the state have proven insufficient, especially in addressing everyday violence, such as police brutality that continues to erupt unchecked in the face of mainstream social justice organizing. Ultimately, this organizing and activism treats the state as a central means 
a stopping the very political violence that ensures its core function, operation and maintenance. We can no longer be compliant, no more being acceptable to kind of the way in which institutions want us to be because it only leads to the same insidious maintenance and control and you know business as usual um, of the government. And so that's the alternative. We don't want to be compliant. We don't think there's any policy or the policy shouldn't be a policy. It should be a complete refutation demand that is outside of the scope of the federal government to challenge institutions. And I think, case Ned, last, this is the last slide. Um, and then if you have time, you all, this is in the presentation that um, there is a guest speaker at 3.30 that's happening in the um, guest, uh, the guest speaker, da, da, da. there's a guest speaker that is speaking uh, um, in the bottle practice, the major one, that same link, it's not mine. Um, at 3.30, so that I would highly suggest that y'all to do that. They are social organizers who have a lot of insight about CJR and how it works. And I would highly suggest checking that out after this, once this is over. Um, you would get a little break, about to a five minute break and then clicking onto that. Um, I would highly suggest that, but I really do need to know um, who, uh, I need to write that, okay. One second. Actually, um, Mr. Um, Amsler, I have a question. Yeah. Um, are you, you did a kind of, a, what is it? Oh my gosh, all these things are happening. Um, a student, what are they, what are, why are our words hard right now? Daddy. When students check in and you have a list of who showed up, are, do you have oh. that? You have that? Okay. I know that, I know that for my students. Heard you. Okay, perfect. That's all that I wanted to make sure of. Can you send me like a, just a quick email of who did so that I can have that for my end too? Um, sorry, I just realized that I didn't do that. Um, but I do Max and Nuriel and Griffin. Yes, I got you. Sorry, let me go to the last slide. We're almost there, y'all. We made it. Hopefully y'all are like, whoa, debate the packet. There's a debate that's happening, a bit more tangible. That's what I love to hear and see, and hopefully I can hear that. Um, so the components of the case said, five parts, five parts and we're done. The first is that the negative wants to problematize AF solvency. Abolition, not sufficient. Trump circumvents the plan. Um, our examples in the packet that currently exist for how you are problematizing AF solvency. Two, the negative wants to use case terms versus the affirmative to prove why doing the AF causes worse things to happen. For examples, in the packet, conservative crackdown, deferral on the DREAM Act, right? Um, that that would, th those things are connected. That one, this would see the political to conservatives, but also two, that this would cause for a move to getting rid of another progressive immigration policy to kind of counterbalance ICE because there's just not enough room to be that progressive on immigration um, policies that are progressive. Um, three, the negative should apply impact defense or internal link defense. Now, if you're like, whoa, okay, Jasmine, that's no, stop, words. Feel you, got you, I'll be better. Internal link defense is how is the affirmative connecting its solvency with, um, oh, thank you, uh, connecting its solvency to the impact, right? So like, how does abolishing ICE, right, resolve the systematic racism that it is saying, right? There is a, there is a connection that has to happen, right, between the abolition part and the impact part. That's the internal link. An internal link defense would be that ab abolition doesn't solve that, right, or doesn't solve for systematic racism, or abolition makes things worse. But in the context of internal link defense, it would be that that internal link does not solve either, because here are all these alternative causes to why immigration reform has not made any meaningful changes in the context of um, black and brown folks who are the main fulcrum of who is you know, criminalized at the level of immigration. Um, but 
Um, and and uh, impact defense would be, and you know, this is where we're going to be careful with our words. You're not saying that systematic racism is not bad. You would say that the affirmative does not solve systematic racism or that whatever impact that you have offered into the debate of what the affirmative does, it's worse. So example, the internal net benefit, right? You would say that the affirmative actually doesn't solve for its own impact because it allows for HSI to no longer exist, which causes worse forms of violence that supercharge, make worse the impacts of the affirmative. Hopefully you follow that. If you don't, I'll be open to questions in a second. Um, Four, not all of these things does the negative need to have. Remember, this is the negative picking a few things, testing around, because you're not committed to an advocacy, right, or a counterpoint or a critique. You're not committed to having to win an alternative. You are committed to proving why the neg or the affirmative doesn't solve, doesn't work, is bad somewhere. So you don't need to have all these things. And also, you should think through, number five, the off case and make sure that the case arguments are complementary, not contradictory, right? So for example, sometimes folks will read impact defense to why there's no impact to like nuclear war, but then they'll have a dissed where the impact is nuclear war. And it's like, wait, you just said there's no impact to nuclear war, but your dissed scenario, impact nuclear war. Well, what's going on there? Uh, if I was the affirmative and I got two advantages, well, let's say one of my impacts is nuclear war and everyone was climate change, what am I doing as a smart 2A? I am kicking out of that advantage and saying, you're right, no impact to nuclear war. I'm going to go for climate change. Takes out the impact of the dissed. Good day. If you didn't follow that, that's fine. We are going to build and grow. Um, but I think that is it.